on today's Story Beat. When I took the job at TCM, I didn't know what on-air promotions was. So my advice is, if you have an in, if you have a, a, an opportunity to get in, to get your foot in the door, and to learn something that you may not be interested in, you do not know what that might lead to later on. Mm -hmm. And so whatever job you get, make yourself indispensable. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Scott McGee, is a senior director of original programming at Turner Classic Movies. He's also a programmer for the TCM Classic Film Festival and the TCM Cruise. Scott frequently presents at TCM events and other film festivals. Recently, Scott authored one of the most enjoyable books about the movies that I've ever had the pleasure to read. It's called Danger on the Silver Screen, 50 Films Celebrating Cinema's Greatest Stunts. If you like behind the scenes stories of how movies are made, and especially about how spectacular stunts and the extraordinary people who pull them off, then I cannot recommend enough Danger on the Silver Screen. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a great privilege for me to welcome to Story Beat today, the author and TCM programmer, Scott McGee. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you for that very warm introduction, particularly oh, when it comes to the book. I really cool. appreciate it. I read it cover to cover and loved every page of it. It was That's fantastic great. to read. That's great. So, so let's go back in time just a little bit. What were your earliest inspirations and influences on the movies? How did you, at what age were you when you started to think, wow, I really love movies enough that I want to head my career in that direction? I want to say it was before I was 10. There was a, there was a, uh, a pivotal moment when I was 10 years old, I think my love of movies actually predated that. My, mo my mother says that my grandmother, who I knew, was also a big fan of, of movie, of classic movies, of old movies, mm -hmm. particularly the films of Paul Muni. And so it might be something in my blood, but, but the way I came to classic movies myself, it really began as, a, uh, as an interest in the films of uh, Abbott and Costello right. and uh, Jerry Lewis. And it was those those comedies, they just clicked with me for some reason at that age. And because of those films and because I would uh, watch them on my local channel, Channel 46 in Atlanta, I had a chance of being introduced to other movies, particularly horror films. And this was by way of the Abbott and Costello films because right. of the cycle where they spoofed the, the horror films of the, of the universal cycle sure. in the 30s. And that got me interested in looking at those films. Well, then I looked at, so I looked at the universals and then I somehow got used to looking at also some of the creature features of the 1950s. And a lot of these films aired on channel 17, WTBS uh, here in Atlanta. And the other thing that, that I think really was a big part of my search for classic movies was our subscription to the TV guide. <laughs> I would go through the TV guide every week and I would circle the movies that looked really interesting to me and really anything that had an age, had any age on it, I would circle it. And this is before we had a VCR, mind you. We didn't get a VCR until 1987. And so on the weekends, especially when I can stay up late, it became a, a challenge to myself to stay up and stay awake as late as possible mm -hmm. to catch some of these uh, some of these black and white movies that would air in the wee hours of the morning. And Saturday nights were particularly painful because I would <laughs> invariably fall asleep on the couch, and then my dad would wake me up in the morning, and you know it's time to go to church. I'm like, gosh <laughs> darn it, I miss I miss it came from beneath the sea. I fell asleep, <laughs> um, and. So there was a lot of uh, what I call begatted, you know, from Abbott and Costello and Jerry Lewis, it begatted the universals, and then it got into the uh, creature features of the 50s. 
But then when we got a VCR, that opened up a whole new world where I was able to find a lot of these black and white classic films in my local video store. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Oh, and the other thing I forgot about were Tarzan films. You know, one of the things that we like to do in my neighborhood was th do things that only kids can do, like climb trees and uh, swing on vines over, <laughs> over, you know, ditches and creeks. And that was a huge thing. That was a huge thing I loved to do. And so I like to pretend I was Johnny Weissmuller or even Ron Ely, uh, <laughs> played Tarzan in the 70s <laughs> and that and it so it just it captured my imagination and there was another aspect to to these movies that none of my friends watched and it was that it was a world of my own it was a it was something that only I knew about and I was not a I was certainly not a nerdy kid I I had a lot of friends I was very athletic so I wasn't withdrawn right. but it was something about this world that nobody else knew about but me and so it, it it was just something that I wanted to learn more and more about and you know and so I started to find books um, about classic movies and in fact I've got the very first book that I ever bought it's it's the illustrated directory of film stars oh, wow and it was it was written by a guy named David Quinlan I don't know when this thing was published but it, it just had bios and, and pictures of movie stars. And so I would go through this book and it's, it's literally falling apart in my hands right now. I would go through and I would circle the films that I had seen. And so it just, it became a challenge to, to see as many as these, many of these movies that I could. And so that, that's really what began it all. But that, that pivotal moment that I've teased at the beginning when I was 10 years old was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, is that right? In 1981. And that that really kind of solidified my love of movies in general. Which harked back to the old movies. Absolutely. Now, I didn't know that at the time. I Like, I didn't know that it was referring to the serials. But, I, of course, I did later on. But Raiders also, it sparked my, my interest in stunt work, which we could talk about later. But, oh, sure. But, yeah, that was, that was really, that, that was really the pivotal moment that, that in, when I was about... 10 years old. So we have a very similar thing in common, only different places. I grew up at 1130 on Saturday night was a show in Pittsburgh called Chiller Theater that was hosted by uh, Bill Cardell, Chili Billy Cardilly, who people will know from Night of the Living Dead, George yeah. Romero here in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, and he's uh, obviously pivotal in that movie at the end of the movie when he's the uh, the reporter who reports on the dead that are walking around. And it was all the old black and white movies, the uh, the various uh, horror movies. So I understand where you're coming from. I, I grew up in that same atmosphere. All right. So where um, did you get the notion that you wanted to program movies like this where did you get the notion that you wanted to write about movies like this you're not a movie maker correct no i'm not a movie maker but that that is actually what i wanted to do first so i i had dreams of of making movies but back then in the 80s uh you know having a camcorder was a rich person's that was a rich family's thing not not a middle class uh, thing that you know that our, our family could afford so right I never had a camcorder that I could actually make movies in my backyard so but I had this desire to to actually direct and make films and so and in fact I I was a <laughs> in my senior class I was one of the senior superlatives for being most talented and um, it, it said in my blurb uh, that I, you know, Scott has dreams of becoming the next Steven Spielberg. That's right. He wants to be a director. Um, I never actually made it, although I, my title is a director, but just not the kind that I thought I would be <laughs> back then. Um, no, I, I didn't go into filmmaking, even though I went to college, I went to Georgia State University with the uh, intention of learning about filmmaking. But there was a, there was a kind of a happy accident where I that led me to where I am today and the accident was I did not know when I was in grad when I was in undergraduate school that I had to essentially suck up to a particular professor who taught the filmmaking courses I didn't know I had to get to know him and get on his list because there was a waiting list 
And by the time I figured that out, it was too late. So I'm like, shit, now I, 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 that's the entire reason why I came to Georgia State was to learn filmmaking. But by that time, I had, I had started taking uh, some of the other courses that I could get in my film and video degree, things like learning about the auteurs of classic Hollywood film, you know, studying John Ford and Howard Hawks and Orson Welles and the others, learning about film genres, learning about film theory, which I had no interest in, but it, it was part of it, learning about documentary film, uh, learning about how films reflect American history and so on and so forth. And so the study of film, not filmmaking, really became my, my enjoy, that was what I enjoyed the most. And so <laughs> when I learned that I wasn't going to be a movie maker, I thought, okay, I, I, I'm enjoying this stuff this other stuff so much that i was really okay with it so you combined your love of the movies with an intellectual pursuit of the movies and it became the thing that you enjoyed the most absolutely you know because you know there was a there was something that i had i observed in one of my classes the aforementioned studying of the auteurs of classic hollywood i did a i did a presentation on john ford and um I realized that a lot of the people in my class didn't know who John Ford was, even though they read about him in the book that we, we had the textbook, but they didn't seem to really care. And that spoke to me, or it, it suggested to me that maybe there's something I could, there's a difference I can make here. Did it bother and, you that people didn't know who he was? Yes, it did. And um, I guess that kind of in, in a subconscious way, maybe it fueled my desire to go into some area of work where I can, you know, I can help, you know, proselytize and, and, and teach people and, and just extol the virtues of classic Hollywood film. And, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of, that was a, another pivotal moment. And this doesn't prevent you from loving current movies, I assume. Not in the least, not in the least. I love current film. I, ha I found, I, you know, I taught screenwriting for more than 10 years here in Pittsburgh. And um, one of the things that was blowing my mind you get students, I'm, I'm talking about recently, you'd say to them, uh, Clark Gable, and they wouldn't know who you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And you think, how could you possibly be a film student and not know the name Clark Gable? Well, they, they don't because it's not, he's not out there, not in the, in the public eye. And there's too much information out there right now. There is, you know, it's, it's so, it's so, so ironic that films have never been easier to see mm -hmm. yet the ignorance, the film illiteracy is so high, even, uh, even amongst the people that, that make movies. Today. Right. Exactly. And it, it, so it's, it's, it, I think in a lot of ways it is because there's too much information out there that people are, are exposed to. Oh, you can't absorb it all. That's for sure. It's just overwhelming. How did you ever get to TCM then? Because you were already in Atlanta and TBS was Turner Broadcasting Systems and that led you to TCM? No, um, I, when I, um, when I got married, I got married in 1995 to my, my bride of 27 years. And um, I tried to get on board with this new network called Turner Classic Movies that I knew was in Atlanta. Right. Um, and I had tried, I somehow got a hold of a producer uh, and I submitted a, a writing test to write scripts for uh, Robert Osborne. So you were writing scripts at the time? No, I was not writing scripts. I was, I was working a job, a nine to five job, all, actually at my alma, alma mater, Georgia State University. So I wasn't doing anything in the field of film. Got it. But I had a degree, I had an interest, I, you know, I wrote, I wrote some film reviews. I had, I had a, a, a good background, but uh, it wasn't enough to get cut through to this producer, apparently. So I kind of gave up on that, going to TCM, and I shifted to the idea of going to graduate school. And it was there were some personal reasons why I wanted to do that. I, I was not a particularly good student in, uh, as an undergraduate, so I kind of wanted to prove to myself, now that I was married and more mature, that I could be a good student. And uh, so I got a, I got in at uh, Emory University for their film studies program, and um, it was a two-year program. 
and that solidified my my um my focus on film history right you know taking films or taking classes on science fiction and film noir and and silent film and uh a, a whole class on just stanley kubrick and so on and so forth and the in the in the professors that i had were very uh encouraging of my career path which was admittedly very limited i did not want to go into academia which is what other people in my graduate classes wanted to do they sure of course go and get their doctorate and become professors i sure. had no no interest in that i <laughs> i wanted to work at tcm and uh and that so was, you had you had that goal early on that was not something that, that was later on you knew early on that's what your focus was yeah yeah tcm started in april of 1994 and uh i entered graduate school in 98 and graduated in the spring of 2000 and um i had made contacts with people uh most notably, there was a good friend of mine, still is a good friend of mine, who worked at TCM. And he put in a good word for people and, you know, nothing ever came about. But eventually, shortly after I graduated with my master's, my friend Bill uh, told me that there was some nebulous position that he had heard about. And this is the hiring manager. He didn't know what it was. So I contacted the person uh and it you know she took a while to respond so you know there's this there's that really strange thing that people who are looking for jobs have to do they have to be persistent but not annoying and so <laughs> so i i guess i walked that line where uh she gave me a chance and so i came in and interviewed for um a job which was a freelance job in the on-air promotions department. I didn't know what on-air promotions was, um, but they hired me on the spot. And you were willing to take a job you knew nothing about. Yeah. And there's the, something to be said for that, by the way. And many people in the world of not just show business, but industry in general um, will take a job that they know nothing about and learn on the job and become very good at it. Well, that's precisely what I did, Steve. Um, after I started, you know, in, as I said, it was freelance, so there were no benefits, and there was no uh, there was no guarantee that I was going to be hired full time. Mm -hmm. So, which was important because I was married, I had a child uh, by then, and uh, so I took a chance. And so, in July of two thousand, I started. About a year later, I got hired full time, and. Over the course of about 10 years, I worked my way up from a production assistant to a senior writer producer in the uh, in the on-air promotions department. And what the job entailed, what, what on-air promotions is, is you make a promotional spots, promotional, what are essentially commercials that promote an airing of a movie or a block of movies on TCM. And so I learned that business. I learned that craft of writing scripts for, uh, for promos, 30 second, 60 second, even some two minute scripts and learn how to be a producer, working with an editor, working with graphics, working in sound design, uh, working with talent, people who read my scripts and just learning the business from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I learned not just to, to not, not just to write promotional uh, material, but also on air promotions at the time and still today, they were responsible for TCM's um, year end in memoriam pieces, the the montages that celebrate the dearly departed. Right. And so I learned how to produce those. I produced four of them in the time that I was under under on air and became uh, just a well-known figure at TCM, uh, known for not just being a writer and producer, but also somebody who knows movies. And um, and so that led to the next 
chapter of my career at TCM, uh, which I, I, can, I guess I can go into sure, now. Sure, please, please do. Because you, you, I was going to say, do you think of yourself primarily as a writer, as a programmer, as a historian, as a scholar, how, or as all the above? How do you think of yourself when you think, hey, you know, this is what I am? How do you present yourself? I guess I think of myself first as a programmer because it harkens back to something that I loved to do when I was a kid. And well, that watch, is watch movies. <laughs> well, not just that. What I love to do was I, I love to try to convert my friends to classic movies. And so I would show them movies, carefully selected films uh, to show them. And so I would show them the Hitchcock movies. North by Northwest was always killed. Uh, Rear Window, um, uh, some of the creature features I would show, a lot of the comedies. And, I, I, and I, so I would, I would try to introduce my friends, uh, not just the kids in my neighborhood, but also kids in my church youth group. You were being a curator early on. I was. And that, that's why I think of myself primarily as a programmer, because I, I and th this is also something that I brought to my job in on air. As a, as a writer and a producer for promos, what that job was is you were essentially trying to convince people to tune in and to watch certain movies. So all of a piece, you're trying to convince your friends as a kid, you're trying to convince me as a, a watcher you don't know at all on TV to watch something that's on the air. That's right. And so that, that's, that's why I think of myself primarily as a programmer, but Certainly as a writer producer, I, 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 I am a good writer. I think I'm a good producer. Um, oh, you're a very good writer. I'm, I'm not trying to blow smoke here. I mean, the book's really good and you're a good writer. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I, I really appreciate that. Um, so so the, um, the next chapter, though, of my time at TCM, and I've been there 22 years next month, um, was courtesy of my now boss. Uh, a, fe a fellow named Charlie Tavish. Mm -hmm. and Charlie is the senior VP of programming at TCM, and he's been there since the day I started and before that, or since before the day I started, I should say. Charlie, mm -hmm. in the time that I was there and, and working at On Air, Charlie had gotten to know me and trusted my, my opinion and my knowledge of classic movies. He just knew that he could work with me and that he liked being around me. So when TCM uh, started this new thing called a film festival in 2000, and this is the summer of 2009, mm -hmm. Charlie asked me to help him program this festival. He had never programmed a film festival before. I certainly hadn't. And so he asked my boss at the time, uh, Pola Shagnon, if the, if I could do that, uh, not work for him, but work with him, and that was that was like being called up from the minor bush leagues to the major leagues. In sure, yeah, that's great. And that opened up a whole new world of being able to not just program a, a live event, but also uh, work with Charlie and also the who the VP of talent at the time and also the managing director of the festival Genevieve McGillicuddy who is still the managing director today and being a voice uh, and bringing a, a perspective to the film festival that I still do to this day and that got me into working you know that that experience working on the film festival eventually took me out of on-air promotions and I sought to start working uh, with the studio unit. I, I worked under a man named Sean Cameron, a friend of mine who's no longer with the company, but that begatted a lot of other stuff that I do. Uh, eventually started working in Filmstruck. And now today I work uh, as a senior director of original programming, overseeing interstitials and in, in short form video content that we air on the channel that brings context and a new perspective to a lot of the films that we show on the network. How similar is the work of being a programmer on the network or writing these interstitials or setting up stuff to being in the film festival world? Is it very similar because you're trying to 
create an emotion or a feeling or what do they overlap in some way or are they completely overlapped? I would say they overlap in some respects, but the, the challenge of, of, of creating a live event that people pay a lot of money to go to, mm -hmm. there is a, 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 a very sobering responsibility to provide the best experience they could possibly have. And so, you know, on air, when you, when you write promos or you or program a block of films for any given night, there's a lot less pressure because it's just, it's just TV. But when you're, but when you're programming and when you're putting together a live event, that is a different thing. And so you have to make, you have to make absolutely sure that when you pitch a certain movie to, to, to Charlie, Hey, I think, I think, I think, uh, you know, for this first night of our festival, our very first festival, I really think we should show uh, Howard Hawks's monkey business. And, you know, I, Charlie, I don't, I don't know if Charlie gave me any pushback on that, but let's say that he did. Let's say he did. It's like, I'm not sure if that really plays well against these other films. For me to say, well, I, I really think we need a comedy here because you've got these dramas and these other houses. And, you know, Howard Hawks with Cary Grant, Ginger Rogers, that there's no way people won't enjoy that. And it killed. I mean, people love it. It played great. And so that kind of, uh, that kind of, of intuition of being able to think, how would a, how would a, how would a festival goer feel seeing this movie at this time during the course of the four days? That's the job of a programmer and uh, a programmer for a festival. And um, so I guess in some respects there are, there is some overlap, but it's a very different animal. Very is, different animal. Is, uh, is one of the goals at a festival to have the various movies in whatever synchronous order they're in uh, is the is the notion to give the audience an overall feeling throughout the festival, or is it you're just trying to find the best movies for each moment? Is there is there an overall thing to it? Yeah. First of all, there's a theme when we when every festival we do we have a theme, and so. Uh, but when it comes to the experience of the festival goer, what we try to do, and and, and by the way, today, uh, well, in the past four or five years it's not just me and charlie but it's also a woman named stephanie thames that we are the three programmers of the festival um i think what we try to do is we try to give as you said an overall experience but we try to create uh opportunities for people if they want if they want to go to if their first choice for a film is is film a and they can't get in because it fills up, then we want to be sure that if, if their second choice film B is gonna be something that is gonna be equally um, enjoyable for them, or it's gonna create a, a sense of, well, you know, my overall festival experience was great. I didn't get into some of the films, but I also got to see some films I had never seen before. So that that's, the, that's what we try to create is this, this sense that no matter what, theater you're able to get into it's going to be a magical experience you're going to enjoy yourself one way or another i my assumption is uh, forgive me i've never been to a tcm festival it sounds great uh, but my assumption is that tcm festivals are existing known movies it's not like many film festivals where they're introducing unknown movies to the public for the first time am i correct that's absolutely correct we so, uh so you have a little advantage there because you know in advance that they had some kind of play in front of an audience before if not a grand play in front of an audience that's true um we do have i mean it i mean the classic classic movies are a bread and butter that's that it's it's called the tcm classic film festival sure. for a reason <laughs> um but that that being said i mean there are a lot of uh a lot of instances and opportunities where we will introduce a film that they have not seen but it falls under a category of of what is appropriate for tcm for the tcm classic film festival um, there could be um, 
There could be revi or, uh, restorations uh, of films that they've seen before, but not seeing it this way. Um, there could be uh, some newer films. You know, we as as TCM as we continue in our journey, you know, a lot of the classic movie stars are no longer with us, and so one of the things, one of the great things about the festival is the chance to see movie stars and directors and other filmmakers live in person, and because we want to show, because we want to have big name talent there, we have to go to some of the 70s and 80s of, of, of movies. And, and so it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to expand the idea of what a classic movie is. But, well, but, well not, not to be too scary about it, but a movie from 1972 is 50 years old. I know, I know. <laughs> so it is, it's a class, and a lot of those are truly classic movies at this point. That's true. But, but, but to our, to our hardcore fans that you may call purist, uh, <laughs> their idea of a classic movie is anything made before 1972. Oh, sure. It'd be the, the 20s, 30s. <laughs> 40s yeah. and probably and, and, a little bit be, of the 50s. And to be sure, I mean, every year we have a handful of uh, pre-code films made before 1933. And those those movies are always packed. Mm. Because people are, they're suckers for pre-code films. All right. So how then is, the, what's the difference in how you program the channel? What What is that difference like? How do you, how do you program your day-to-day -day work? Well, I will say uh, I actually do not program the channel. I see. Uh, the, so I work for Charlie, but he's got a whole other team within the programming department. They're the ones that program the day-to-day -day channel. Gotcha. Uh, now I will I will uh, give ideas for programming, um, and uh, and I will. You know, I will create original programming that complements the, the films that we have on the channel, but the day-to-day -day programming of the channel itself, I don't really do. Gotcha. So uh, what is the cruise then? Is the cruise just like the, the festival, only on a ship? The cruise is very similar to the festival in the sense that you want to create an experience that, uh, that the cruisers will love and that will be true to the classic to the TCM Classic Cruise uh, mantra. The, the difference between the cruise and the festival is with the cruise, you have our client, you know, the people that come on the cruise are a good deal older than the people that come on the, to, to the festival. Um, so the people that come on a cruise, they want to see a lot of the acknowledged classics. They don't they don't necessarily, they're not, they're not necessarily looking for challenging films. Uh, so, and by that, I mean, you know, one of the, so one of the things that we show at the festival, or we, we have this category called discoveries. And this is, uh, this is a, a, an opportunity for us to show restorations or previously unheralded uh, films that, don't get a lot of play on TCM or anywhere else. So this is an this is an opportunity for these movie fans, these cinema aficionados, to see films that they can't see anywhere else. Give us an example of what you mean. Um, so for okay, so there's a um, uh, there's a I'll give you an example from just the past festival. Uh, there's a, a a filmmaker named Ben Burt who is. Uh, an Academy Award winning sound designer. Indeed. Uh, ben created all the sounds for Star Wars and Indiana Jones and, and the like. And Ben has been, he's been working, uh, doing stuff for at the festival for years and years and years, along with his uh, creative partner, uh, Craig Barron. Well, Ben had this idea to take a 12th chapter serial that was created by Republic Pictures in 1942 called Spy Smasher. And we've always wanted to show a, a, a serial at the festival, but it's kind of hard to do when the, when the, when each chapter of a serial is 20 minutes long and there are 12 chapters, you're mm -hmm. looking, you're looking at a more, more than a three hour long event. So it just wasn't a practical thing to do. Well, Ben's idea was to uh, take the 12 chapter serial and re-edit it 
to a 90 minute feature. Oh, nice. And so he, so he debuted this cut at the film festival under a new title called Spy Smasher Returns. Now, <laughs> there, I'm sure there are some TCM cruisers who might be interested in seeing that, but it's, it's kind of an experiment that. And so that is something that we probably wouldn't show on the cruise just because people may not know what they're getting into. So it's a little, I assume the people on the cruise are a little more into nostalgia they, th than into, into something uniquely different. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. How many movies do you think you've seen in your life? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> gosh. I've seen a lot, but it, it, you know what? It turns out always to be a less number than you might think in your head. Because if you think about it, if you saw, if you saw two movies every single day, of the year, you'd be seeing 700 movies. And over 10 years, that'd be 7,000 movies. So, you know, sometimes I think in my head, I've seen 20,000 movies. I know I haven't seen 20,000 movies. Um, how many do you, uh, you've probably seen a lot more than I have, and, and I've seen a few. Do you have a clue? No clue. No clue, no cl but it's, I, I, it's I thousands, obviously. I can't even, oh yeah, I, I can't even, I can't even guess. I, I will say that, one of the one of the things that I, I still do to this day that I've been doing since 1986 is every time I see a movie in a theater, I save the ticket stub and I write down on the stub what the movie was, the date, and I store all of these ticket stubs in a jar. And I've got a jar. It's about it's like the size of a thermos. And that thing is choked with ticket stubs i don't know how many ticket stubs are in there but it has to be close to ten thousand that i've seen well, maybe not ten thousand but five thousand i'll say five thousand right but it but it is choked and that is just films that i've seen in a theater in a theater and then you watch a whole lot of other movies on a, a video screen or a tv screen or whatever kind of screen it would be other than in a movie theater yeah and you know and i just by sh just staying with the sheer numbers my dvd and blu-ray collection is numbering in the four thousands mm. um i haven't seen all of them but um but a good a good deal of them gosh i don't know nobody's ever asked me that before steve <laughs> well i got lucky then <laughs> so let's talk about your book which i again i think people should check out if you have any love at all for the, the the vast history of movies and the stunts that are in them this is a really great movie because you, you go all the way back to the beginning and you bring it close to the the current crop of movies so what was your process in developing the book now the book is in chronological order you mm -hmm. start back when and you come forward you didn't you didn't do it by plucking out various stunt people and focusing on them you focused on the movies themselves so did you know that ahead of time before you started to work that that's the way you were going to put the book together? Yes. I, I had the idea of writing a book probably seven or eight years ago. And in the course of my research, I wanted to write a book that talks about the, the, the specific films and tell the story of how these stunts were put together mm -hmm. and how the stunts the, help the films become absorbed in the public consciousness. Uh, the example, the shorthand example that I give a lot is nobody walks out of Ben Hur talking about the leprosy scene. <laughs> no, everybody, sir. everybody comes out talking about the chariot race. Of course. And so, what I wanted to do was tell the history, or I should say a history, of stunt work in the movies through the prism of specific films. Mm -hmm. And and tell that story of, in making the argument that a big reason why we enjoy movies today, why they stick in our, why they stay in our heads, is because of the stunt work. And, and, and you know, and I, I would say that an unspoken reason for that is I wanted it to be I wanted it to be a simple uh, 
a, a simple way of people to think, okay, I'm, I'm reading the story of how these stunts were put together in Ben-Hur or Baby Driver. And I'm, I'm beginning to understand now why stunts are important and why they aren't just a fool's errand. Uh, they, they're not just a, a, a career of men and women taking courage out of a bottle of whiskey before they pull off these gags. It is a art and a science. And because of that, uh, I think stunt work should be considered an art form just as much as choreography or production design or cinematography or any other uh, aspect of the filmmaking process is. And so that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create an easy way of saying, of, of people learning that, wow, there's a lot that goes into stunt work. Maybe I should, maybe I should think of it more than just falling off of a, off of a building. Well, for the, the problem forever has been is that the stunt people, male and female, are supposed to be invisible. That's right. But then again, so is the editing in most movies. And so is the sound design supposed to be invisible and all that. And so I don't know if you're like me, I bet you are. It's time for the stunt folks of the world to be given a uh, category in the Oscars. Uh, wholeheartedly agree. And um, look, I know the Academy, they, they, uh, they have a lot of reasons why they haven't given the uh, started the category yet. And, but, and, but I know in my heart of hearts that they will someday. And here, here's why I know, because before 1981, there were people like uh, named Jack Pierce, uh, Bud Westmore, uh, uh, and so many other makeup artists that never got an Academy Award. Right. And it's because there was not there wasn't a category for it. Right. And that so it didn't they didn't create an Academy Award for best makeup until 1981, with uh, Rick Baker winning for. Uh, uh, history American and uh, werewolf in London. Right. So I think the Academy is just very deliberate and, and just very methodical in introducing new categories. I think eventually they will, they will eventually recognize stunt work, uh, as a, as a process, as, as a legitimate, um, uh, category in the Academy Awards. So I, I agree totally. I think that it, it's time has come. They need to recognize it because it's they, as you say, it's such an integral and important part of movie movies in general and movie making. That one of the reasons why it's so important, I think, because I'm a storyteller. That's what I do for a living. That, that it is such an important part of a story. We talk about in story structure and storytelling. We talk about heroes, and what? Why do we have stunts in movies so that we can show our heroes being heroic? And we don't want to endanger the stars. So we bring in people who become experts at doing those pretty wild and crazy things. So it's all part of the storytelling. So why isn't it awarded in the same way? Absolutely. You know, and it's not just, I, I would, I would also say that it's not just action films, but there are, you know, stunts are, are a big part of high pivotal dramatic moments in movies. Totally, totally. Uh, so you know, think of uh, Gone with the Wind in 1939, when um, when Scarlett O'Hara and and uh, uh, Rhett Butler are, you know, the, at the zenith of their of their relationship of their conflict, she takes a swing at Rhett Butler, misses, and tumbles down the stairs. Pregnant, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the character of Scarlett O'Hara was pregnant. That was a stunt woman who doubled Vivian Lee. And if you didn't have stunt people. You couldn't do that scene as as it was written, as it was portrayed, and that creates a, a moment that people don't forget, and it, it creates a beat in the drama that is highly important uh, to 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 see when it comes to that relationship between Scarlett and and Rhett. So, all right, let's forget about physicality for a moment because it's mainly a physical job. What kind of mentality do you think it takes to become a stunt person? Did you, I know you, you talked to a number of people about that. Yes, I did. And I would say that it runs counter to what a lot of people assume. And a lot of people assume that stunt people, stunt professionals are a little crazy, which is to say they assume that they're daredevils. Stunt 
professionals are not daredevils. Daredevils, I mean, you could go onto YouTube and see what daredevils do. Sure. They're the ones that jump bicycles or ride bicycles on the edge of a skyscraper. That's a daredevil. It's somebody who is going for a thrill, uh, who is going for publicity, for attention. That's not what some people do. Some people are filmmakers, first and foremost. And so I think of stunt men and stunt women as professionals, sober minded in knowing that they are there to do a job of work. They are there to uh, meet the needs of the director and of the script and to, to portray action that is important and relevant to the actors and actresses whom they are doubling. I think that's so, a very, very good so they're, explanation. They're not crazy. They're not foolish. Um, now, they do get a thrill. You no, know, I mean, at, you couldn't be a human being and not have some sort of adrenaline rush uh, jumping a car, you're turning over a car. Uh, but that's not why they do it. They, they do it because they're, they are also storytellers. But they, there's no question. I've, you know, I, I'm a huge stunt freak. So I, that's part of the reason why I enjoyed reading the book is that I love seeing stunts and watching stunts and I watch them over and over again. Um, clearly a stunt person, though they're calculating that they're, they're being as safe as they possibly can. They're taking all kinds of precautions, but there's something about the way that they think that's different from the average person walking down the street. They don't think like, like you and me, because you and I are not going to uh, harness ourselves and jump off the side of a building. We're, at least I'm not. I don't know about you, but I don't plan to do that any day soon. <laughs> so you, what, what were the biggest challenges you had in writing the book? What was the thing that was the most difficult to get through? I'll tell you, it was being accurate and getting the names of the stunt people right. Mm. And being able to identify who is actually doing that stunt because I, I take I took great per, de, uh, great caution in identifying in the captions for any photos that I included in the book. I wanted to make sure that I was identifying these stunt men and women properly because there's not there's not a lot of of uh, documentation um, saying uh, as I say in the in the introduction of the book you know there's not a lot of documentation that says well stuntman you know bob smith pulled this gag for roy rogers in that western picture in 1943 so it's it it's tricky and i will say for your listeners i will i will um i will say that i got i got one wrong in the in the finished book is that right i did in uh in the butch cassie and the sundance kid chapter i uh i talk about a um a stuntman named howard curtis uh, and Mickey Gilbert. These are two guys that doubled Redford and Newman for the famous uh, cliff jump when uh, a bunch of Sundance are cornered by the by the posse. They make this jump, and it's it's really it's really good. And I tell I say in the book how they did it. Well, there's another stunt in Butch Cassidy that I talk about, and that is when Butch and Sundance are they pull they've uh, stopped a train and they're trying to rob it, and uh, Butch tries to blow open the door of the boxcar with dynamite and they are standing there and the boxcar goes absolutely kablooey the entire thing which prompts Sundance to say think you used enough dynamite there butch well uh <laughs> Mickey Gilbert was doubling Robert Redford just as he had in the in the uh cliff jump but it was not Howard Curtis who uh who did the gag for the boxcar it was actually the stunt coordinator of the film, James Arnett. Hmm. And I miss, I misidentified Howard Curtis doing that gag in the book. And so if Mr. Arnett is listening, I, I think, I believe he's still alive. My deepest apologies. And in the, you know, should I have a chance to revise it for a second printing, I will be fixing that. Well, but that, but it just, it just, it underscores the difficulty of, of identifying these men and women who's, very jobs were to be anonymous. Well, that's it. That's that, that anonymity. And they don't identify at the end of a movie. This stunt was performed by that person. 
Right. <laughs> so you have to actually do some digging. I assume that's one of the biggest jobs you had was going and finding, researching or talking to people about who did what. Yeah. Yeah. And some and some in some uh, resources that I found and I would say resources that I trusted and still trust, there is conflicting evidence. One book will say this guy did this stunt and the other will say somebody else did that stunt. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a it's a bit of a high wire act. When you had that dilemma and you were faced with it, how did you how did you deal with it? What did you do? I went with my gut. I, I went with uh, not just the uh, the biography and the experience of the stunt person that I that I was writing about, but I would um, I would just sort of weigh the evidence. I would weigh what what one resource was saying versus what the other one was saying, and I would consider um, I would consider what their sources where their sources were coming from. And just in some respects, just taking an educated guess. Did you come across um, information that was surprising to you or took sudden twists or turns and you went, wow, I didn't expect that? Yes. Um, there was a um, there was a, um, a gentleman who I spoke to uh, for the Jason Bourne films. I, I In the book, I talk about uh, the Bourne supremacy and the Bourne ultimatum. Yes. And there was a, uh, a, a, a stunt man and stunt coordinator named Jeff Amata. And, uh, and I spoke to him on the phone at length. Uh, and he told me in his work with, on the Matrix films, he worked with the, the fight coordinator on the Matrix films is a man named Yun Wu Ping. And uh, Master Wu Ping is the man who specializes in wire work. He's the one that, uh, for the film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, all of those ballet scenes of Chow Yun-Fat and Michelle Yeoh and, and the other actors uh, being suspended in air on mm -hmm. wires, mm -hmm. that was all his work, his choreography. He did the same thing for the Matrix films. Um, and he's also directed a lot of films. He's a, I mean, he's a legend in, the, in, in movie making. Well, Jeff told me that Master Wu Ping told him that Master Wu Ping worked on a 1966 film called The Sand Pebbles. Oh, really? And this is a film directed by Robert Wise, starring Steve McQueen and Richard Attenborough. And it was shot in Hong Kong. And on that film were some American stuntmen including uh, a, a man named Lauren Janes, who doubled McQueen uh, for a lot of pictures. And there were a handful of other stuntmen too. In that, during that production, they hired some local uh, citizens, uh, a lo local townspeople in Hong Kong to work on the film. One of them was uh, uh, Master Wu Ping. And they learned stunt work the basics of stunt work from these american stuntmen visiting in hong kong huh. so in a way you can look at it from american stuntmen telling these hong kong uh stuntmen what they know and then those stuntmen like master wu ping then becoming their own masters in stunt work and now american stuntmen are learning from him how about that so there so there was a there is just a circular learning that went on that I, I did not expect to know and expect, expect to learn. I'm curious, did, did, did that then result in um, the inf influencing Jackie Chan? Yeah, yeah, that was a big influence. I, in fact, there is a rumor. I, I could not substantiate uh, this, this uh, rumor, but, there, but in some sources that I read, uh, Jackie Chan was supposedly at the set of the sand pebbles as a kid huh i don't know if that's true or not it, it could be apocryphal but certainly the people that learned uh stunt work on the on that production certainly taught jackie chan uh how you know in his in his tutelage as a as a young filmmaker and actor um so there yeah there, there had to have been influence from that from that set
It's always interesting to me when one generation teaches the next generation and the, the, the next generation is standing on the shoulders of the one that came before. And that's in everything. That's in writing. That's in um, business. That's in science. It's true in everything. I think that's always a fabulous thing. Um, did you need to obtain various rights to publish this book? No. Uh, when it came to, when it comes to uh, uh, in, in talking with our legal counsel at TCM, he said that, you know, when it comes to photographs, uh, we have kind of a, a, a wide berth in terms of uh, uh, rights. What I had to do was secure the rights to the actual picture. So if there was a photo that I found, like a lot of the James Bond films, I had to, I had to license and get permission from Eon from mm -hmm. uh, or Dan Jack. I, I, I don't know which which they go by, but from the rights holders of the James Bond franchise, I had to get permission to use some of the some of the uh, photos that were taken by the by the James Bond production team. But otherwise, you were pretty much carte blanche for the most part. Yeah, I, we, you know, in, in, in oh, especially when it came to to likenesses of actors and actresses, I did not have to. I think that falls under fair use. I did not have to get licenses or, or permissions for that. If someone's sitting out there listening to this and they, they're about to embark or they've already embarked on writing a book that's of this nature, where it's something that really exists and there are real people involved, would you recommend that they obtain some form of legal counsel before they go to a publisher? Yeah, I think so. I, th I don't think it would hurt. I think it would certainly help uh, embolden them and what they are, what they're wanting to do. I think when it comes to arming themselves with knowledge of what to expect, uh, I think it wouldn't hurt to have some sort of legal counsel. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just to have some basic understanding of where, of what their rights are when it comes to usage of photographs and books. It, and, and I'm sure there's also some, some uh, fairly accurate and legitimate sources that they could find on the web or in other books that can kind of give them a just a kind of a blueprint of what they can what they can and cannot do when it comes to photographs mm -hmm. um but yeah i think in general i think it might be worth it, it certainly might be worth it i wouldn't pay them thousands and thousands of dollars uh the the any attorney that they would consult but just some sort of introduction i guess so you the the back of your book is uh two three pages of very small print of all the reference sources that you are citing um and so you did a lot of reading and a lot of study and you looked at a lot of articles and many books and you talked to a whole bunch of people uh, how long did it take you to actually assemble all that information so when i when i started to seriously think about a book again about seven or eight years ago I, uh, I started to do research and uh, it became almost, it became a hobby really. You know, I, any spare time I would have, I would scour uh, legitimate sources of, of research on the web. But more importantly, I started to make visits to the Academy Library, to UCLA, and started to find books and magazines and newspaper articles that helped me tell the story and, and gave me context to how these films were made. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a wide, a, a wide range of research. It was, uh, ex it was exhaustive, but it was not ultimate. And, and I use that word, what, what am I trying to, not ultimate, but maybe comprehensive. In other words, what I'm trying to say is as much research as I did, there is still more out there to do. Oh, you know, for I, sure. There, there, I did not, I did not uh, tap every element that I could. And part of that was the pandemic. You know, when I, when I got the green light to write the book, I was, I was limited to the room that I'm in right now, mm -hmm. the basement of my house, the windowless basement. <laughs> um, and so I was, I was, uh, I had to depend on, not just what I can find on the web, but also the the huge library of books behind me, but also the two filing cabinets that of research that I had that I had amassed over the past seven or eight years, and so everything that I that went into the book had to come 
from those three sources of, of, uh, of research. Also the, the copious notes that I had taken uh, on films that I had watched through three or 400 movies that I had watched over the years. Um, ideas and, and notations and thoughts that I had jotted down uh, that also went into the book too. So, um, but all, but also the interviews that, that was, that, uh, sorry, that was another major thing that I was able to do from the basement. I was able to reach out to people and talk to them on the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, people that I did not talk to before the pandemic in person, I was able to, some of the, some of them, I was able to reach on the phone and have really great conversations uh, on the phone. And, and uh, that also went up, uh, was a major component of the research of the book. I, I bet it was. Um, are, are you planning to write any more? Yes. Uh, well, let me, I should say I want to write more. I want to write another book mm -hmm. on this subject. Um, there is a, um, there's a very useful book that was written in the 70s by a man named John Baxter, who is a, a prolific writer of film history, has written many, many biographies and on the various subjects of movie history. And he wrote a book on stunt stunts in the movies. And it was a, it's a history. And it's a very good history, but there's a lot more, there's a lot he did not include and a lot that, uh, that has come, you know, that has been a lot of movies that have been made since that book. There's no Raiders of the Lost Ark in that book, you know, cause it, it came out before Raiders. Right. Um, so I would like to write a, a, a formal history of stunt work in the movies. It would not be a, a readable coffee table book like the like danger on the silver screen it would be a very different book in scope and in, more academic it would be more academic yeah so, so, something more for researchers to read rather than the average audience yeah i think so but 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 as i as i think you'll you will have noted in in this book i think it is very useful for researchers and very useful oh, oh for sure history. But the beauty part of it is, is you've written every movie is only two, three, four pages. It's not like you've gone on and on for 30 pages for each movie. It's nice and short and sweet and very easy to read and lots of wonderful pictures and all the rest of it. You narrowed it down to 50 movies out of thousands of movies that have stunts in them, thousands of television shows. You could do a whole thing on TV stunts, too. Right. Um, which one or two movies do you, did you finally cull out of the herd and wish that you could have included them in the book? Any? Oh, yeah. Um, the Seven Ups, which sure. is, a, which is sure. from 1973. Uh, the reason was, why that, was that also Bill Hickman? It was Bill Hickman. Mm -hmm. And it was directed, by, directed and produced by Phil D'Antoni. Right. Um, the reason why I didn't include that chase, uh, that movie, is because um, in the 70s, there was such a boon of car chases. And in the, the book, it reflects that, you know, with Bullet in 68, French Connection in 71, Smoking in the Bandit in 77. I just, I was, I just had too many cars. Sure. And so uh, to tell the, the full story, to include uh, the seven ups would be kind of redundant because I had already talked about Bill Hickman with, uh, with the French connection and bullet and, and also bullet. Uh, and so there just, it just didn't seem, it just wasn't needed. Yeah. For the listeners that don't know, Bill Hickman was the stunt driver. And I, I assume the coordinator as well of the stunts in bullet and in French connection and in many other movies. Um, he also was in the French Connection as Muldrig. That's and, right. And so, um, he to me, he's a very interesting character. Yeah, he he's uh, he. I mean, he had been in Hollywood for a very long time. He um, uh, some sources I, I did not include. I don't think I included this in the book because I I could not corroborate it. But he was uh, it, according to some sources, and I think one of the sources is Leonard Maltin. He was one of the little rascals as a child really uh not a not a major one but a, a kind of a bit part that's interesting um, but he did spend a lot of time on hollywood lots in the late 30s and into the 40s because his father worked worked in the business hmm. and he eventually uh started acting and also driving cars uh in, in uh 
there was a film called uh, uh, To Please a Lady from 1949, I believe. I think it's an MGM picture. It stars Clark Gable and Barbara Stanwyck. And it's, it's set in the racing world, race mm. cars. Yeah. And Bill Hickman uh, appears in this film and also drove uh, uh, some of the race cars and became good friends with Clark Gable. Uh, in fact, there's a, a, there's a funny, a really funny photograph. Uh, you can Google it. Um, if you Google Barbara Stanwyck, Clark Gable, and middle finger, I think it'll come up. <laughs> but there is a, uh, there's a picture of uh, Clark Gable, Barbara Stanwyck, one other, one other actor whose name I can't remember, and Bill Hickman. And the four of them are lined up side by side, and they're all giving the middle finger to the camera. <laughs> and it's hilarious. But uh, Bill Hickman is, I think he's the one on the far left or the far right. Uh, and because of his immersion and because of his, because of he, him being a very well-known uh, person in Hollywood, he became friends with a lot of these people, including Clark Gable. But I also became friends with James Dean. And it was... Uh, uh, Jane, it was Bill Hickman who was following Dean. Oh, really? In, in September of 1955. Oh. September 30th, I think, is the day James Dean died. And uh, Bill Hickman was following him because they were on their they were on their way to a race, and James Dean was driving his poor Spider too fast, and he uh, he was he killed he was killed in this car wreck, and according to Bill Hickman. He, he pulled uh, James Dean out of the wreckage and Dean died in Bill Hickman's arms. Oh my goodness. Do you think Dean was trying to outrace him? No, no, he wasn't. He was, it wasn't a race that it was, a, it wasn't a race between Dean and Bill Hickman. Uh, it was just that Dean was, was ahead of him and he was just driving fast. And Bill, Bill was following in a, I think at a, in a station wagon behind him hmm. uh, with another person. Um, but uh, so, yeah, he he was uh, very well known in, in Hollywood and and um, and was he was a legend. He was a true legend in the business. Yeah, I have been speaking to Scott McGee for an hour and 10 minutes. And um, it, this has just been so fascinating and so much fun to listen to you talk about all this uh, stunt work that's been out there forever. Um, so I, we're going to wind this thing down a little bit right now. I'm just curious. You've clearly uh, worked with and met lots of people in the industry and you've been around a long time uh, programming and on and festivals and so on. And I'm just wondering if you have a story that you could share with us that's either weird, strange, quirky, offbeat, or maybe just plain funny. Well, uh, you bet I do. And I, I have a I bet lot. You got more, I bet you got more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of uh, stories that I could tell you, but I'm going to tell you one. Mm -hmm. And it is a it is a humdick, a humdinger, if I do say so myself. So one of the great things, one of the privileges of working at the TCM Classic Film Festival is I, I am able, I have met a lot of really wonderful people that I have uh, admired their work. I've seen them on the, on the big screen and I have been able to share moments with them that, um, while they may not remember me, I certainly will remember them and remember the moments. You know, there was, uh, you know, spending time with Eli Wallach in 2010 or, or even sharing a bag of popcorn with actor Ron Perlman. Uh, it's just little stuff like that that stands out. But anyway, there was, a, there was one festival, I think it was in 2012. I'm not sure about the date, but Kim Novak was... Uh, one of our special guests, and um, she was there to shoot a hour-long conversation with uh, Robert Osborne on stage. Right. It was a big production. It was being filmed. And for this day, I volunteered uh, to be Miss Novak's escort, a talent escort for the day. Uh, we make sure that we have a TCM person escorting the big talent at all times and so i spent a great deal of time with kim novak and her husband and also her also her manager uh when we were getting ready 
to start shooting, uh, Miss Novak was in the wings of, of the theater. And uh, it was time for the audience to be let in because we had to get, we had to start the show rolling. And Miss um, Novak was in the wings of the, of the theater being mic'd up for sound. The sound guy was trying to uh, attach a lavalier mic to her blouse. Right. And uh, he couldn't see. And um, so because I was standing by not doing a damn thing, I took out my iPhone and turned on the flashlight. Thought that would help the sound guy. And indeed it did. Well, um, I was standing a few feet back because the sound guy was running the mic up through her blouse. Miss <laughs> Novak, she's a professional. He's a professional. Well, look, I love Kim Novak, still do. Uh, Vertigo, oh my God. Not only that, but, you know, James Stewart plays a character in, Vert in Vertigo named Scotty. <laughs> That's my name. Yeah. And so I'm standing a few feet away with this flashlight and Miss Novak in her husky voice says, closer, Scotty, closer. <laughs> um, I, I turned all sheets of red, shades of red. And uh, so I stepped closer, but I still kept a respectful distance because mind you, again, her blouse is pulled way out so that the guy can get the microphone in. And she pulls me closer and has my phone practically down her, her <laughs> shirt. And I am, I am looking the other way. I am not looking. I am being respectful because by God, this is Kim Novak and I am, I am going to be a professional <laughs> and I am, and I am thinking to myself, I cannot believe this is my job, <laughs> but, uh, that was, that was probably the most up close and personal. I got to Kim Novak and, uh, uh, God bless her. She, she's a fine lady and, and, uh, uh, she's still with us. I, I hope to see her again someday, but she, but that was a, that was probably the most memorable moment I've had uh, with, uh, with classic Hollywood. It, she, I'm sure she said, thank you. She did. She was very, she was very, uh, very appreciative. Uh, we got a picture after and um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's, uh, you know, those are the, those are the fond memories we don't forget. That's for sure. That's um, very true. All right, so last question for you today. Um, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip? for someone who may be starting out and wants to do what you've been doing all these years to be in programming and be a writer and publish books and so on, um, or maybe someone who's in a little bit and trying to get to the next level. Yeah, uh, well, it, 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 it refers back to something I said at the beginning. When I took the job at TCM, I didn't know what on-air promotions was. So my advice is if you have an in, if you have a, a, an opportunity to get in, to get your foot in the door, and to learn something that you may not be interested in, you do not know what that might lead to later on. Mm -hmm. And so whatever job you get, make yourself indispensable and make yourself a known commodity within that, within that job so that other people can look at you and say, you know, that person, uh, pretty good, pretty good worker. Uh, they they know their shit uh and they may th this person this other manager this other director whomever may think i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to them and see what if they may be able to help me out with something or maybe they might be interested in this job um the other thing i will say and this is particularly pertaining to people who you know work in in corporations and, and um, uh, corporate, corporate America, I should say, don't be afraid to quit and to take other job opportunities. Um, one thing that I did not do in my, in my position at TCM is I never left. And um, 
my one thing that I, I kind of, I've always wondered is if I, what if I did leave TCM? What if I went to another TV network? Um, because I'd see a lot of, uh, a lot of my former colleagues, they left and they became, they, their, their ascension in their careers just kept going up and up and up much faster than mine did. And so what I, what I would say to any uh, person out there is, you know, if you're in a job and you like it, you may still want to entertain the idea of moving somewhere else, of going to another job. Because as you, as you move around, you learn more and you gain more experience. Uh, and it became, it, you become more marketable as a, as a creative um, or, or a non-creative. So I guess what I'm saying is don't be afraid to keep looking and to keep and to stay hungry for what might be around the corner. That is really wise advice. That's wise advice for anybody in not only the entertainment industry, but pretty much any industry is to keep looking and stay hungry. That's, those are two really good thoughts uh, because um, you know, in today's world, you just don't know where else uh, you can get to and where else that can take you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Scott McGee, this has been a fantastic hour and 15 minutes plus, uh, and I can't thank you enough for spending some time with me today on Storybeat. This has been a lot of fun for me. Well, Steve, this has been wonderful as well. Um, I have I have earned my uh, my vodka soda that's coming to me later uh, after this interview. And so we've come to the end of today's Storybeat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.